Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome back to the Espon seminar here in Tallinn. Please take your seats now. Great. So yesterday during the seminar, uh, at one point over a hundred people were watching online and the average number of people participating were between 70 and 80 online. I asked the question, where are they watching from? And the answer is somewhere where there's an internet connection. So uh, we know that's good. Let's say a special good morning, firstly, to the digital natives. What I'd like the digital natives to do is to give us one of those type movements. All the digital natives, can we see it, please? OK, all the digital uh, migrants, can we have a wave from you? A wave from digital migrants. And all the digital dinosaurs, what about a big yawn? Yeah, good. OK, so you're all back. Great to see you. Now, this morning's session is going to focus on the territorial future of Europe. And as you know, there's been a huge buildup of activity towards the debate that's going to happen here, with contributions, of course, from the Committee of the Regions, the European Parliament, from Espon itself, from Eurocities, many other groups. And you know that the TRIO presidency uh, that's putting together uh, the program for the next series of presidencies is on intent on uh, developing a proposal for a roadmap. And that roadmap aims to build upon the Territorial Agenda 2020. It's going to focus on territorial diversity and the different kinds of development challenges that exist in Europe. It will be thinking about the territorial dimension of place-based uh, approaches for the European uh, cohesion policy post-2020. And it will also talk about how those cohesion objectives translate into concrete uh, EU actions. At the same time, it will be looking at how Europe's regions can provide more in terms of the EU achieving globally agreed goals, such as the Sustainable Development Goals. And it will be trying to include the European urban agenda and thinking about the role uh, that, uh, that can be played by the urban agenda in the development of competitive regions. And it will also be thinking about multi-scalar uh, levels of governance collaboration, uh, both at the EU level and the sub-level. So this um, territorial future of Europe agenda is a big theme. It's a perfect theme for the ESPON conference to address. And how we're going to do that is firstly with three short keynote speeches, 15 minutes each, offering particular perspectives on the territorial future of Europe. Then we'll have a panel discussion uh, here on the stage. And during that panel discussion, we will open up for contributions from you using Slido in the same way that we did yesterday, promoting your questions, voting on the questions that are set there so we can see which questions people like the most. And we'll use the old technology of hands up if you just want to ask a question. And at the end, we'll be doing a poll in the room so that we get your opinions and perspectives on the territorial future of Europe in a way that we can capture in the synthesis report of the conference overall. So that's the plan for the next two hours. Really grateful to those of you who've managed to get here bright and early. During the course of the morning, I think more people will join us, but we're going to try to start on time. So it's a great pleasure now to introduce our first keynote speaker of the morning, who is Claudia Baranzelli. Many of you know Claudia because she's from the, the, the DG Joint Research Centre, and she's going to make a presentation on the territorial reference scenario uh, for the future of Europe. Please join me in welcoming Claudia. Claudia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Greg. I apologize in advance for my voice. I hope it's still intelligible today. So let's hope. Well, um, I'll start. Um, OK. So today, uh, with this presentation, I would like to share with you um, what is, uh, really briefly, the contribution of the Joint Research Center to the territorial agenda. As you may or may not know, um, our uh, modeling platform called the LUISA is explicitly mentioned together with ESPON in the tool number 33 of the Better Regulation Toolbox of the European Commission. So today I'll speak not only about scenario-based projections, but I'll try to briefly explain you also how we get there. So what is the territorial knowledge uh, base that is behind mentioning 
a few examples of uh, historical analysis. And if time allows, uh, I'll also um, briefly mention our dissemination strategies for the data and the analysis that we produce. So let's start from some definitions. So what's a territorial reference scenario? Um, it can be understood as a baseline scenarios, so sort of benchmark against which we can compare different alternative scenarios or alternative policy options. It assumes the most likely socioeconomic trends, and this is really, really important because this is a tool that is used by several policy DGs in Brussels. So we have to agree with them. Um, and uh, we take on board the European Commission assumptions on future economic and demographic uh, outlook. Amongst uh, several sources, one of the most important one is the ECFIN Aging Report. And the few examples that you see in this presentation, they all refer to the latest available Aging Report. Actually, just a week or so ago, um, we got the news that ECFIN finalized the new um, economic and demographic outlook. So now we are already starting to update our reference scenario uh, in the coming, uh, which will be available in the coming uh, months. We take on board also the expected uh, effect of European <laughs> policies which have a known territorial uh, dimension. Um, cohesion policies, the CAP for the agricultural sector, TNT for transport, and so on and so forth. And in this way, we are able to capture and to analyze the cross-sectoral impacts and interaction between different policies at different um, uh, spatial scale, as uh, we'll see uh, in a minute. In order to get to these uh, um, results, we have to rely on a rather vast underpinning knowledge base, which is composed by two main components. On one hand, we have a regional socioeconomic database, which cover both um, historical uh, and historical period and projections. These are economic variables and indicators such as GDP or employment. Uh, depending on the indicator, the data date back to uh, 1980s until today, and then projections up to uh, normally 2030, in some cases 2050. The second component of the knowledge base is um, I would say humongous geographical database, which uh, gives us information on where economic activities are located, where services are present across the territory, morphological information about the territorial, uh, the European uh, territory, etc. And all these, uh, the reference scenario needs default configuration. It's updated on an yearly basis in order to take on board major updates. Um, just to give you some examples of um, input, uh, uh, input data that is behind our approach. We have a very nice representation of a social infrastructure distribution across Europe, so the exact uh, geographic location of where, for, where, for instance, uh, hospitals or schools are located. Um, we have a very accurate uh, uh, representation of transport infrastructure for both the road and uh, um, railways. Uh, same goes for the energy infrastructure. Uh, lately, we have been investing a bit more time in uh, collecting and harmonizing data on buildings and households at municipal and sub-municipal level whenever possible. And as I mentioned before, long time series of socioeconomic uh, parameters. We are also trying to complement these uh, traditional data sources with crowdsourced and big data. Uh, yesterday, uh, this topic was, uh, was briefly mentioned. Uh, and we go from uh, very high resolution satellite imagery to personal weather stations that we use uh, to monitor the um, uh, microclimate uh, in urban areas, social media, and of course all the services that Google makes at disposal. So why, uh, why do we need all these, all these tools? I'm, I'm sorry that the titles are cut from the slides because they're an integral part of the presentation, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, 
Because, as we all know, uh, European regions are widely, widely diverse. And so uh, if we want to assess the local and regional impacts of European policies in a meaningful way, we do have to take into account that physical features, socioeconomic, demographic and environmental characteristics are all specific to their location and their regional context. So we have to be able to work across different spatial scales from the very local one up to uh, up to the national scale. Uh, here I have just a um, simple example, uh, a um, straightforward example to exemplify this concept of working across different dimensions, but uh, I will not uh, spend time here. What we are looking is basically uh, for the coming 10 years, the expected um, population changes across Europe at national, and that's two level, and that's three level, down to um, the geographical location of the changes, which I'm not seeing in the presentation. Um, I need some technical assistance. <laughs> what are you right. right. All right. All right. Sorry. Um, so um, in order um, to um, make use uh, to all these uh, um, all these tools that we have at disposal. In the last year, we have dedicated uh, quite some time to analyze major uh, European trends, looking at both historical, um, historical periods and uh, um, projections, reference projections. And uh, we have dedicated quite some time to the analysis of determinants of regional and urban growth. Uh, we have been looking at regional competitiveness. We're really interested in demography and urbanization, and of course, also quality of life, for which we have developed uh, both a regional and uh, urban indicator. Starting from uh, determinants of uh, growth, um, if we look at the past uh, 10 years um, of data, so from 2000 to 2040, again, it was in the title, but it got cut. Um, we can indeed identify few uh, variables uh, that can explain 80% uh, uh, of the variance that we have in our data, um, such as initial uh, GDP per capita, share of working population with different education attainments, and so on uh, and so forth. And uh, of course, we can also concentrate a bit more on the um, effect uh, of specific variables. And for instance, if we think about spatial spillovers, we can indeed map uh, GDP growth um, uh, at regional level across Europe and clearly identify two big clusters of regions with either high or low growth. Um, in the first case, neighboring regions self-reinforce self their growth. In the second case, they negatively affect their reciprocal um, growth. And uh, when we talk about competitiveness, uh, again, we can select few key variables, uh, such as employment shares, GDP per capita, or young uh, dependency ratio, and analyze the past uh, 10 years of data to, uh, to see how changes evolved. So starting from 2000, going to 2005, we can identify across Europe a general upward development trends. So low and medium competitiveness regions tend to improve their performance. Um, until 2010, uh, this upward trend continues but uh, slowing down until 2014 when the negative impacts of the economic downturns are clearly visible. And uh, this is another example that we have been working on, um, analyzing the role of cities in the economic, uh, economic growth. Here the main message is that uh, not all metropolitan regions are equal. So whether we consider capital, second tier, or smaller metro regions, uh, the behavior is quite different. And this has uh, important policy implication because one, uh, a kind of one size fits all um, of policy will not, uh, uh, will not work. Um, so far, we have been talking about uh, historical trends, historical data. 
Um, here we're looking at uh, uh, projections, so again, the coming 15, uh, uh, 15 years. And yet again, if you look at demographic changes across Europe, it becomes clear that uh, location, uh, location matters. For instance, not just, uh, all cities across Europe behave in the same way, but for instance, depending whether they are located in core regions or peripheral regions, they behave rather differently, losing or gaining uh, population. And this has important repercussions if we want to assess the effectiveness of um, European policies. Think, for instance, uh, the investments in infrastructures. Um, there, their main objective is to increase potential accessibility of the entire European territory. But in order to do so, we cannot just consider the amount of money that is invested in the physical infrastructures. We do have to take into account how population distribution will likely change uh, in the future. Otherwise, we will provide a biased, uh, uh, biased uh, outcome and uh, results. And of course, once we have set our reference scenario, it becomes really interesting to play with alternatives, with uh, um, policy options. Here we're looking at uh, an example that uh, DG Regio asks us to work on, a um, convergence scenario based on the hypothesis that GDP per capita and productivity will converge in the, uh, in the long uh, term. And uh, of course, we can design uh, alternative policy options also keeping in mind specific uh, performances or specific uh, topics such as the quality of life in cities. And here we are looking at an example on the air quality and level of population exposed to uh, pollutants concentration levels above the legal limits. So here it becomes really uh, interesting to play um, and to combine different technological assumptions, different uh, um, likely um, population or uh, urbanization patterns, and then understand what could be the potential role of, for instance, local planning instruments in order to counteract or better to um, ameliorate the performance of cities, for instance, regarding uh, air quality and uh, quality of life. So as I, as I promised, I'll conclude my presentation mentioning uh, um, how we disseminate uh, data and the output of our analysis. So far, um, we have developed two main web platforms. One, the territorial dashboard, is dedicated to uh, regional data, meaning from uh, NUTS 0, so from country level down to NUTS 3 level. And the urban uh, data platform, which is uh, instead dedicated to uh, disseminate data on cities, different aggregation levels, so cities, metropolitan areas of different types, and so on and so forth. In both cases, we provide mapping tools and interactive charts that any user can download and use. And of course, the, um, the actual data behind can as well be downloaded. Uh, we have now plans to merge these two platforms in one, and we also have ongoing uh, talks with other uh, commission services, such as Eurostat, uh, to investigate the possibility of uh, um, interlinking our respective platforms in order to provide one uh, consistent service to, uh, to our users, which are, uh, of course, any type of stakeholders, policymakers, and of course also um, the citizens. So I invite you to um, explore uh, the data and the analysis that we make available through uh, these platforms. Please download the data and, if you wish, uh, give us your feedback. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Claudia, thank you very much indeed. And despite your sore throat, you actually managed to be audible throughout. We really appreciate that. You emphasise that this effort is going to be about a combination of standing territorial knowledge with trend-based analysis and also a review of the effects of policies. You talked about the importance of using crowdsourced uh, uh, information as well as big data, and you talked about social, dem demographic, economic and territorial uh, data. You emphasised a couple of important things. Diver
diversity and specificity in, in European territories, multi-scalar analysis, the challenges of path dependency, self-reinforcing concentrations, cumulative causation in the territorial system. But you also talked about the effects of cycles of activity, particularly cycles of population change and economic change. And you said that in the end, the core work was going to be a future-looking prospective, if you like, of the, the different way that uh, the territories of Europe uh, might emerge and the implications that these different scenarios would have for policies. And you were uh, already developing ways of modelling different policy frameworks around those scenarios. You mentioned at the end then that there will be a number of data platforms that become available from this work and that that will be available to the scientific community uh, and the policy making community more generally. So thank you very much indeed. Really fantastic. Um, yesterday uh, you all met uh, Kai Bon from the uh, Spatial Force site uh, GmbH. Kai is going to pick up the story now with our second keynote of the morning, uh, focusing on territorial cooperation for the future of Europe. Kai, welcome back to the stage. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, before starting, I actually would like to take the opportunity to thank the Estonian President Espon for the splendid dinner yesterday. It was really well done and nice, and also the sessions yesterday. Shall we give them a round of applause? Yes. <laughs> so, but now I need to use my 15 minutes, even though it's not just three. Um, talking about the future and the European future, um, I think, I'm not Claudia. Um, we need to remember that things are pretty uncertain. So this picture comes out of another study, not for Espon, but I think it's a good reminder of all the uncertainties we have around, and we need to keep in mind that there are a number of disruptive elements that might f change our future, as we think. So what I would like to do today, based on different studies we have done, to say a little bit about territorial challenges, most of those things you know already, Going from that a little bit, how do we actually meet those challenges? How does cooperation play a role in here? And from there, how could future cohesion policy help? So if we think about the challenges, well, that is a summary of basically all the work that you have done over the last year. So it's nothing we really have done. We just went through all the ESPN reports and thought kind of what are the main important challenges. So you will recognize most of it from yesterday or from previous presentations and years. And as Claudio already mentioned, there are a number of things where we see actually concentration tendencies in terms of population or economic activities. And most of that going to kind of north and western European areas and metropoles, maybe excluding Germany, but as in population, not so well advanced. At a lower level, we see also a lot of suburbanization processes going on that are very important. And also, as highlighted yesterday, the challenges of kind of shrinking regions in the peripheries, which get more and more prominent, and how do we actually address territorial futures and policies in that direction. Also, in economic terms, we see a similar pattern of concentration of GDP to certain centers. And we see also here on a lower level quite a lot of increasing social inequalities, which at one point we probably also have to address if we think about territorial development. Then there is a lot of hope always kind of that the new technologies fix, will fix it all. And if you think 20 years back, kind of the end of geography, we all do teleworking, everything is fine and nobody cares about where we are. It didn't work out that way, really. And if we now think about the third or fourth industrial revolution, depending on whom you follow in the counting. Um, we actually see that there are a number of tendencies where people assume that it accelerates further territorial differences across the world, basically saying that it will be more of an industry where the winner takes it all. And the winner might not even be in Europe, but those in Europe might then very strongly centralize the main effects, whereas the rest of us will be just users. Um, we see also, that if you look into the European part, that again, kind of urban areas in Northwest Europe are at the moment leading in terms of locations where innovations are made in that direction. Also, when you think about the circular economy, we see actually a number of centers where things in terms of industrial symbiosis are leading the way, so where there are more changes done at the moment and trends are set. And that is kind of the European picture. Again, looking a little bit below, we actually see that within the urban areas, agglomeration advantages are not that high. So we see quite a lot of urban sprawl on a lower level. Um, 
well, all that is not just happening individually in every territory. And I think that is something we address in S1, but we actually probably need to get much stronger, that there are quite strong linkages between territories and what's happening in one territory is affecting another territory. And those kind of the flows and different kinds of interdependencies we looked a little bit at, and I come back to that more when I talk about the cooperation needs. But just kind of if you think about our daily life and the ESPON work done there, we see a lot of in our daily routines, service to general interest for daily needs are kind of creating certain flows towards kind of regional centers. Also the sharing economy we actually figured out has a lot of flows and kind of need for certain critical mass that generates at a local level or local regional level a number of interactions there. If you look a little bit in a broader picture and kind of takes a European one, I think we have seen yesterday in the pitching sessions quite a lot of that on kind of flows towards kind of knowledge centers, foreign direct investments, freight and migration hubs. So there's a lot of that going to kind of certain centers from areas. What I found interesting, which is highlighted in one or two of the ESPON studies, but not elaborated on so much, is that when we talk about migration, we usually talk about people moving from A to B, and then we have a fantastic <coughs> surplus of expertise in the place where people move to, if it's kind of the wanted migration and we have brain drain on whatever in the areas where people live from. But there are a few hints in the Aspen research and saying there are also kind of soft flow back dimensions, which actually means it's not only kind of you move away and you forget about that region and looking around, quite a number of us actually don't live in the country from where we come originally. And just think about it, how much of a kind of want you still have to your hometown, home region and what is going on there. So there are a number of aspects that are still kind of maybe a little bit under-researched in some parts, at least in the Aspen context. <coughs> Running through it, um, we looked a little bit more than based on the study I presented yesterday, saying, well, if we imagine kind of these are the general trends, if we take now a very specific take and say, okay, by 2030, in the next 12 years, we change completely, and we change to a circular economy in Europe. And here, we also need to agree on what is a circular economy. And in our discussion with the experts, it was very clear it is not just kind of a waste and resource management system, but it's actually kind of a shift in our economic model, which, which makes a difference when you talk about the territorial impact. So think it kind of wholehearted, real, and not just saying, well, we do a little bit more waste management and resource efficiency. But if we then assume that we do the kind of wholehearted change of our economic system towards a place-based circular economy, then I'm afraid to say that will be quite dramatic changes in all parts of Europe, in particular if given the short time frame of a little bit more than 10 years. And we probably see, on the one hand, quite a lot of disparities between the strong economic areas and lagging regions, which may decline to a certain degree. So there's a hinge of more cohesion, which in a lot of the discussion and literature we went through comes from saying our production systems change. So we go a little bit away from this large scale production centers where we produce and produce and produce and we send that out for consumption and it's thrown away. We produce new and we send it out for consumption, it's thrown away. To kind of less new production, more recycle, repair, which is organized in a much more decentralized way. So we don't kind of have everything in the big production centers, but we get actually more activities going on all over the territory, which helps to kind of work a little bit against the concentration tendencies we have seen. And that helps in particular kind of small and medium-sized towns where you have a critical mass to really establish smaller activities and industries around that, and where you have still enough critical mass also to work in an industrial symbiosis for those parts. It will be much more complicated or challenging for sparsely populated inner peripheries where basically the critical mass for those things is slugging, so the disparities or their challenges might actually accelerate. We might also see that those kind of gigantic hubs of these are the important transport hubs, that is kind of Frankfurt, that's Amsterdam, that's Rotterdam, these are the hubs, might have a little bit of change if we don't produce as much anymore newly and send that out around the world or around Europe, transportation patterns will change substantially. So the big transportation hubs might 
face a little bit of a decline of their importance. And the same goes for the kind of major industrial production sites. And then, of course, as said earlier, we have a potential for those that already are now leaders in circular economy innovation settings that sense, will send the standards and kind of distribute their technologies. We try to put that on a map, and well, we had just that as one of many topics to address, so we didn't kind of have the chance that the new project that was presented yesterday has to really go through every single detail. So we worked very much with a participatory approach and had a series of about 12 kind of different mind maps in the end, which we co-checked with data. And I think the part of that map is not really to spot your region and say, I'm blue, I'm red, I'm whatever, but it's more saying, well, it has different impacts in different parts of Europe. So the yellowish part are probably those that are more challenged by the change in the industrial setting, whereas the blue ones are where the innovation things are taking place. The striped red ones are where at the moment the level of waste production is simply very high per inhabitant, partly or mostly actually per for tourism. So where a number of adjustments will be seen. So that's just to give you a glimpse and then as announced yesterday, the new project will give you the real data in, a, in the next seminar and have much more detailed thorough analysis on that. If we have a similar assumption about renewable energy and saying in the next 12 years we change completely to a renewable energy system. So th there we are. And also here we had huge discussions with our experts saying what does it mean and what does it include? And the tricky issue here was transport. Is renewable energy also including transport or not? And a lot of our analysis on standard, it doesn't include transport, but that's kind of another section. Our experts in our focus group said, well, you can't do that. If you want to take it seriously, you also need to think renewable energy in terms of transportation. And now all of you who have traveled here, think about your trip here in terms of renewable energy and how that would be possible. So also here we have a little bit of an impact. So on the one hand, as in obvious as kind of those areas that produce renewable energy and have a lot of potential for that, they probably can benefit from exporting those energies. But we also see quite a difference in the f ability to finance investments that are necessary. So in able to exploit the energy potential that you have in renewable production, you actually need to do a lot of investments. And that ability is not equally distributed. Uh, across Europe. At a lower level, I think if you think about also we produce on the top of our house, et cetera, energy, also there is a certain location aspect where outside central city locations, the house owners benefit most from it. As I said, transport was a tricky issue, and here we all will be challenged, but again, perif peripheries much more, and then of course all the areas that have very industry, or energy intensive industries will have it. And that again, actually accelerates a little bit of an east-west divide we have at the moment if you look at the types of industry we have around Europe. So just a few of the challenges ahead given those preconditions. Then how can we master them? And the idea was we can't master them on our own anymore. As a no city, no region, no country can in that complex world say, I master that from my territory. We actually always depend on what is happening elsewhere, and therefore we need to cooperate, which kind of in the end, I think my colleague Maria sitting over there, that cooperation is a must, not a luxury. So we can't just disregard that. We had also then a very nice map by Klaus Spiekermann and, and colleagues made on the impact of disintegration. So if we would cooperate less, what would that look like? Again, look into the report. I don't have all the time here. And um, so then whom do we cooperate with? And I think here the idea of the functional areas that we also emphasized yesterday are very important. And that ranges from functional rural regions, urban rural partnerships, cross-border regions, transnational regions, macro regions, Europe, Europe, depending on the topic, you would need to pick the relevant area. And then if we just run through a very few topics in the last minutes here, and if you look at the more local rural urban cross-border regions, I think there's production and consumption in a regional system is important, critical mass for boosting circular economy, where we often need to have neighboring industries coming together, transport services, local labor markets, strengthening the knowledge economy, spillover of FDIs, service provision on a daily part. I think all that, and that's nothing new, and that's already happening. Like in the circular economy, the Basque country is quite good on bringing together partnerships about 
smart specialization around circular economy industry. So saying we need to come together from different parts of the region. So that's going on. We just need to have more of all those things. Same at the transnational, macro-regional level, kind of migration of different kinds, centralization of knowledge economy. How do we deal that at that level? Transmission infrastructure for energy, critical mass for new technologies are quite important. And that sounds trivial, but I actually talked to the head of research and development from Ericsson, kind of a minor company in the technology field. And she's being located in Stockholm. Sweden is too small for us. Even the Baltics become too small for us to test things, to draw on expertise available. So we need actually to cooperate much wider, not only in getting expertise, but also in testing new products, etc. And that leads then over into IT solutions that can be done transnationally, services of general interest that are of a wider service. And I guess being a Sonia e-service are a natural take. Also here an example, the Baltic Energy Market Interconnection Plan, where the Baltic states say we are all part of the European energy net, but we still need to get much closer and do something here. And then ESPO needs to do a lot. So I think that you can see. Then we close with the cohesion policy part. And again, just repeating that kind of we need to do more. And I think we also need to really think, regardless which fund, regardless which program, basically every program should have an element on functional cooperation or territorial cooperation, saying if I have a regional or a national program, also there I need to think what is the functional geography of the actions I fund and how can people cooperate. And then also get that further down to the cooperation or to the projects. And I talk here about territorial cooperation, it's not interact. So we should still should keep interact. We should just go beyond, beyond what we know in interact, ITI, CLLD. And if you then want to know it all and want to get all the details, take out your mobile phones, take a picture of the QR code, and you get the parts that I can't tell you because Greg would kill me now. <laughs> and there you can also tailor make your reports and really go by topic or by territories and get your personalized tailor made report. Thank you very much. Kai, absolutely magnificent. Thank you very much. I have no desire to kill you. I have a strong interest in your longevity, so <laughs> do keep going. Um, you talked to us at the beginning about uncertainty. You said there's a huge amount of uncertainty in this space of thinking about the territorial cooperation for the future of Europe, and you mentioned particular territorial challenges, such as concentration chains, the shrinking regions, the interdependencies of various places. You talked about technology and innovation as, as a kind of a hope, uh, but also as a, as a space where even more uncertainty was arising. You mentioned, of course, the challenges of winners and losers, and you talked about the, the links, the flows, and the interdependency between regions. I thought your two illustrations around the circular economy and renewable energy were really fascinating in terms of tracing the different patterns of territorial implication that the emergence of these two phenomena had. And then in your final remarks about the interdependencies of place, you stressed the need for cooperation, recognition of the multi-scalar dimension of cooperation agendas. You talked a lot about regional systems, spillovers, critical mass issues, and how to get uh, the right scale of approach and the right sensitivity and flexibility within that. You said within all this, there's a lot of work for ESPON, and there are a lot of implications for cohesion policy, and you very kindly gave us a link to the work at the end. So, uh, Kai, thank you very much. You've done us, I think, a great service, and we're all indebted to you. Um, let's now go to the, our third speaker of the morning, who's Andreu Uliad from MCRIT at, uh, uh, in Barcelona, uh, Catalonia, uh, where they've been doing a wide range of work on a territorial reference framework uh, for Europe. Uh, Andreu's presented this work in a number of distinguished forums, and he's now going to present it for us. Andreu, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Greg. I know you are going to make a wonderful synthesis of anything I will say you. I will say so. I'm relaxed, <laughs> <laughs> even though I didn't sleep much yesterday. So uh, we will begin working in a project called Towards a Territorial Reference Framework for Europe. I keep changing. Yes. This the, the green top one. Top one. The, the green top one. one. Yeah. Okay. Our mission statement is like that, facilitating a foresight process towards a territorial agenda post-2020. 
These are the companies we, we will work and the key persons on the Strategic Advisory Forum. So it's uh, MCREED, the European Policy Center, which is the first time working on, on, on ESPON, and we, we needed them very much. Special Foresight, Politecnico di Milano, and then uh, ch chairing the Strategic Advisory Forum, Professor Jacek Zlachta and uh, Marjorie Jouen from the uh, Jacques Delors Institute. This is the, maybe I will remove this, <laughs> so I can see more easily. So this is the working plan we have. So basically is a, is based on, on the one hand on facilitating a participatory process with a number of events, and on the other hand developing alternative scenarios and policy options to be discussed on these events that most of you will be invited. Uh, let me know in this presentation, briefly, briefly, briefly introduce you a number of, uh, of thoughts, thinking on the, on, on the baseline and scenario analysis. And I will say just something about the, the policies, but I will, I will leave this mostly to Jacek uh, and Alison Hunter that will participate on the panel afterwards. So about the unexpected events we are living, I will focus on, on three unexpected, let's call unexpected events with major territorial impacts. The number one is the economic crisis uh, from 2008 that I don't know if it's over or we are just used to live in this crisis. And I will focus mostly on the implication on the south and the east of Europe. Then the political crisis, the Brexit, which is the most important one. And then the humanitarian crisis, which maybe is the more troubling one because it's affecting the, the European core values. All of these crises will have lasting impacts and they have a lot of territorial implications. I will spend a few minutes on this map, which is one of my favorites from, uh, from ESPON. This was made by uh, Professor Camagna and Professor Capello from the Polytechnic of Milano in the worst uh, moment of the crisis in 2010, 2011. Maybe for them, for our colleagues, was the best moment of the crisis because we're very exciting. These are economists working on, on the middle of a crisis on a modeling, but for the ordinary people it was the worst moment in 2010, 2011. So in this map, you see uh, the GDP in average in Europe was growing uh, 1.9, which is not bad because this map this, this forecast assumes the austerity policies that were in place. So it was a baseline. So 1.9 means that the, the, the more developed European regions keep growing at above 2%. So it's a map showing increasing disparities. In red, you see uh, regions in the south that, according to this forecast, will likely uh, will, will lose one, two decades of growth. In pale blue, you see uh, regions which are growing uh, 1, 1.5 percent, mostly in Eastern European rural, sparsely populated regions. In, in the east part of Europe, you see in dark blue, uh, mostly capital cities which are growing uh, above 2 percent. Anyway, they are not converging with the European average, which is 2 percent. So it's a map of increasing disparities in the south and in the east. It's a map showing kind of the core periphery uh, paradigm back. So it was not, you know, it's the, the message of this map was, I will say, controversial when it was, uh, was published. Afterwards, uh, we were lucky, let's say, because the austerity policies were relaxed, because uh, some reforms were carried out in the labor market, meaning lower salaries, meaning worse working conditions, but that was good for the microeconomics. And also we are lucky, so the energy prices at world level were down, so the oil, oil price was down. So, so the crisis was not that hard, but almost, in the sense that unemployment got hard, was very hard, very high, about 20% in some regions, about 50% for youngsters. Uh, we had less social expenditure because of the austerity policies and less public investment, precisely when it was more needed. This means that informal economy, maybe in the south, in the south regions, now is maybe 25% of the GDP. So you have to take into account that the GDP is, in this map is maybe 70% of the real one, on the, on the real life of people. 
And this has uh, social and political conflicts linked, obviously. Maybe I'm going back to, to Marx again, mm -hmm. <laughs> in the sense that, that the economy is, you know, maybe is the first thing to look at, not the only one. What are the cohesion policy implications for this? Because after this, we cannot think in the same way on cohesion policies. Uh, there are contradictory impacts of cohesion policies. On the one hand, let's say in Poland, uh, they, they had investments, public investments, because of the co-financing of the cohesion funds during the worst moment of the crisis. This was very positive, especially for the large cities. And in Spain, uh, to, to tell you another example, is completely different because we, we, we believe that we had overspending in the, in, the, in the years before the crisis. At the same time, we had a, a real estate bubble. So maybe cohesion funds exacerbated, exacerbated the crisis even. So, so when we see Germany. Uh, in Germany, it happened something curious, which is because of the savings of people from the rest of Europe going to finance German bonds, maybe Germany saved, uh, according to some think tanks, one billion euros in four years, which is one third of the whole cohesion funds, which a lot of, so a lot of imbalances happening all around Europe. So need for fiscal harmonization, banking union, and so on. So things are going to be uh, different. And this map was kind of a, for me, it's kind of a, a good, iconic image of this moment. It was also a crisis of legitimacy of European institutions and so-called technocrats. Um, here is uh, Mr. Blanchard, chief economist of the International Monetary Fund, fund that said uh, forecasters significantly underestimated the increase of uh, unemployment and the decline of domestic demand associated with fiscal consolidation. So basically, we got our multipliers wrong, so we didn't understand well the impact of the austerity policies and so on. And, you know, it's easy to create this story of we the people against the bureaucrats, technocrats, the cosmopolitan elite. Actually, uh, it's a paradox because, you know, the, the these, uh, these persons are not that bad in the sense that they, they are competent and they are even honest, as, as, the, uh, as, as Mr. Blanchard demonstrated, saying that, that they were wrong. I, I, I like to say that uh, our colleagues from Milano got the multipliers right. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's good to know. I mean, for me. The second crisis I want to talk about, which is related to this one, is the political crisis. This map is wonderful, it's very famous, sure you know that blue are cities in England, the whole Scotland, and, and municipalities in the border between uh, another island and the rest of Ireland and Belfast, which both remain. And in, and in, in red you have uh, municipalities, mostly in England, uh, that both live. It's amazing how maps geographic ma maps based on political geography explain uh, uh, cultural mindsets, because we have seen this kind of maps also in Poland, also in uh, France, also in Spain. And, 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 and also, uh, I mean, all questions like cities versus countryside, global, anywhere versus local, somewhere, younger generations between uh, older generations, even utopia against retropia, all these questions, we can make these questions in every different country. And, 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 and they are old and new questions at the same time. You know, retropia comes from uh, the last book by Simon Bauman, and, and he said in his book, uh, in the choice between the paradise lost on the promise, and the promised land, British uh, prefer paradise lost, which is kind of a symptom of our uh, moment. We can make the same questions on, on, on Scotland. I like this picture because there is a European flag here. Also, there is a Catalan flag here. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, is, this, is not, this is not nationalism like the 19th century. This is something different we have to think about. Uh, even in the debates, they were talking about the well-being of people more than about the traditions or whatever. So we have to rethink what is the meaning of these processes. This was a picture from my window. This is my street. So I was concerned because my grandmother, my mother, which is 82 years old, was there. <laughs> so, you know, what is interesting is that everybody was using the mobile phone. 
to, to create this effect of light. I remember 25 years ago, everybody used the lighter. Mm. Now, nobody smoke right now, and everybody <laughs> has a... Maybe this is more important than actually the, the reason for the demonstration, that people yeah. are using mobile phones instead of lighters. Mm. This changes everything. Mm. Uh, an, an interesting paradox, I like this map because it's, it's like, like the, uh, everybody, all the citizens in Europe, you know, showing the mobile phone. <laughs> so <laughs> it's the light of people. But there is something which is really interesting from this crisis, which is for the first time, for the first time in history, we have two women as major in Madrid and Barcelona. Huge change. The second important thing is that they represent these young, urban, well-educated, populations, which are cosmopolitan. They are new in politics. They, become to, they, be, they belong to new parties. And they agree on the solution of the conflict. And both they are in opposition of the Spanish and the Catalan government, which is something very relevant. So cities are different from countries in this sense. So we have to think in a different way, many different aspects. Also, these two uh, women agree with the manifest demonstrations in favor of the refugees. So you can see people demonstrating in favor of self-determination, which also demonstrate favor in favor of welcoming refugees. So again, this is not 19th century nationalism. This is something different. We have to think twice what it is. And this is the most important crisis for Europe, more important than the previous one I mentioned, I believe, because it's, it's touching our, our core values as, as Europeans. This is what, what is happening, you know. Germany is very different from the other countries. I, I will say it's much clever because uh, aging and, and lack of uh, the pro demographic problems are, are going to be solved in this way in the long term, even though they, they may have problems in the short term. You know, we have officially, officially 3,000 people dying crossing the Mediterranean Sea. Maybe the real figure is 10,000 people dying to cross the Mediterranean Sea. And, and I... I, I think we have to include at least the, the whole Mediterranean in the ESPON maps. This is something I <laughs> always tell people. We have to include the whole Mediterranean because we are living, uh, you know, um, uh, Tripoli is closer, Tripoli and, and, and Benghazi are closer to Marseille than Brussels. So we have to think about the, the, the geography matters. And this is the most important thing, more important than the previous one. You can forget everything I said and just focus on this one because it's the crisis of who we are, what is the human being. Because you don't know if this hand is, belongs to a human being or to a humanoid. And this is changing everything. Maybe this, this will change. We were talking yesterday, maybe in two, three decades. We don't know. But the way we talk on, uh, let's say, on, on smart cities, so some people say before we were living on the farms, now in cities, in the future we will live in internet. So you imagine smart cities like, like uh, millions of small eyes, sensors everywhere, surveying, surveying us, watching what we are doing, sending data and information on us to a server which is taking uh, optimal decisions. So a friend, I have a friend that's, that's, that, that used to say that only robots will be happy in the smart city of the future, <laughs> only robots. If you are not a robot, you will have problems because you will, be, you will make, make mistakes all the time. He says all, something I, can, I don't know. Okay, I, I'm going to say what he's also... No, I'm not going to say this is not... You've got 39 seconds. Yes. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I'm going to move <laughs> to the second and last part, which is just three slides, just introduction to, uh, to the panel. So, what everything I said is useful and many things that we will be talking on these 10 events in relation of the future of Europe is going to be useful uh, to create the basis for the new territorial agenda and what kind of, of animal should be this territorial agenda post 2020 to be useful to deal with these problems, challenges, opportunities and many others. This is the first question we, we have. Um, this is related to the vision. So in the previous territorial agenda, uh, there were a number of, uh, of, of, uh, a, a number of aims. The first one is promote polycentricity and balance the territorial development. We have to think what this means for the next decade. Uh, the goal is 
probably the same because it's the European way. We understand cities this way. We don't like megalopolis of 20 million people. We like networked cities. We have to think how this, what this means on the next decade. And maybe we have to introduce new ideas like co-development with the neighboring countries. Maybe we have to explicitly recognize that I think Russia is 100 kilometers from here. So Russia exists. And also Libya exists. And, and we depend on them for the energy a lot. And this last, uh, the last image I have is, is about policies. So the most difficult question is how we improve the integration, the coordination between sectorial pretending to be just-in-time policies and integrated place-based policies. And there are three questions that, that Greg probably will explain much better than me and will ask you afterwards, mm. which is how to introduce multi-level territorial cooperation in the framework of mainstream European sectoral investment programs, uh, planning and implementing place-based integrated European investment programs in close cooperation with cities and regions. And the third question, providing European support to local, regional, and development strategies. They are maybe not in the same direction, so it's one or the other. So this is a, a key question we have to uh, investigate on this uh, coming 18 months and all these events. And we will ask you to help us, to provide us a first insight on this. So this is just the last image telling you what we are going to do the next 18 months. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andreu. 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 Yes? If you take your label, I'll take mine. And you can go over to that seat thank and you. I'll stay here. And I'm going to give you this. Is it yours? No. No? OK. Great. Andreu, thank you so much. Um, apart from the fact that you woke everybody up, with your economic crisis, your political crisis, your humanitarian crisis, and then your identity crisis. You also, I think, explained rather brilliantly uh, what is the backdrop of the mindset and the key challenging questions and priorities when thinking about the territorial reference framework for Europe and what needs to happen. You also explained all of the background in terms of previous formulations and documentations. You explained the leadership and the governance of the process that you're involved with. And you also talked, I think, very importantly for people in this room, uh, right at the end, about new ideas concerning space, the relationship between places, new ideas about uh, collaboration uh, within the EU and outside the EU. And also you came back to the fundamental challenge that was raised yesterday about how to integrate sectoral approaches with place-based approaches. So, Andreo, thank you very much indeed. You were very clear, and as I say, I think you woke everybody up. So we're very grateful for that. Now we're going to shift to our panel. In a moment, I'll invite them to the stage and ask you to welcome them. What I want to remind you is that we want to use Slido where we can so that the questions are a little bit more democratic. We try to answer the questions that everybody likes as much as we can, and we get onto all of the questions if we have time to do that. So don't forget to uh, go to your web browser, www.sly.do. Uh, don't forget that the, uh, the, the number is ESPON. You've put in the code ESPON. Then you will be able to start asking questions, favoriting questions, supporting or endorsing questions, or making comments. If you want to make comments, that's also fine. We'll get people to react to them. Now, to join uh, Andreo on the stage, firstly, we're going to welcome Professor Jacek Szelacta from the Warsaw School of Economics. He'll be joined by Alison Hunter, who's Special Advisor on Regional Policy at the European Policy Center. Ro Romana Mi Minarikova, who's from the uh, ESPON uh, Management Committee. Roland Abta, who's also from uh, the ESPON uh, Management Committee and is the Project Support Team Member uh, from Austria. Welcome to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the panel. So the idea here is that we're going to give the four people who haven't yet said anything five minutes each to respond to what they've heard and to make their own contribution to the discussion about the territorial reference framework for Europe. 
Whilst they're speaking, you're free to pose questions on Slido. After the, fire, the four lots of five minutes, we'll then open up immediately for the debate with you, and we have until 11 a.m., so we should have enough time. Now, Jacek, with your blessing, we'd like you to begin. We know you're already playing a very important role in the project because Andreu has introduced that, but please take five minutes to give us your reflections on what needs to happen. Uh, thank you very much for an invitation. Uh, I uh, pre prepared two background slides, which I would like to ask to show. And uh, as, you, as you already are aware of, after Greg's speech, there are many players fighting for future of cohesion policy. Mm. And I will be speaking about territorial dimension of that discussion, mm. but I pointed out the, the uh, papers, ideas, documents, which were presented by key, spe uh, key participant in that dialogue, European Commission. As you see, finances are dominating the, the discussion. Uh, we have Monty, Commissioner Monty report, we have famous white paper of Commissioner Juncker. Uh, we have five re reflection papers concerning different challenges Europe is facing in the future. Where to move up to the second? The green one, the big green, green one. one. The big green one, the big one. Okay. The one of the big one. Okay. That's it. And then, after reflection papers, we have cohesion forum. We had uh, uh, late June. Uh, since October, we have seventh cohesion report, and it is expected that uh, May next year there will be first commission communication of financial framework. And I, will, I have eight comments only on uh, uh, territorial aspects of discussion. First one, territorial dimension is practically missing in reflection papers, and. Uh, there are six criteria applied by Juncker White Paper. There is no cohesion there. Second, urban policy practically missing, and urban policy has strong achievements. It is, uh, cities are important assets of Europe, but still it is on secondary place. Third, uh, friendly statements concerning cross-border cooperation territorial uh, cooperation, etc., what has been already pointed out by our speakers today. Fourth one, changing in advantage perception of cohesion policy. When I read some statements presented in Monty report, it was like uh, we are still financing many projects of questionable uh, value and cohesion policy was mentioned there. Uh, it is changing and in cohesion report, it is much better than that. Uh, the uh, fifth uh, comment is that within uh, this uh, uh, reflection papers, we have six proposals concerning post-2020 cohesion policy. S uh, comment number six, uh, there is high quality analysis of European space presented in seventh cohesion report, some very fresh but there is missing chapter on future of, of, of cohesion policy. It was just taken away. And when it was fifth cohesion report seven years ago, we had full framework of how the uh, cohesion policy should evolve uh, in current programming period. Comment number seven is that uh, what Andre already pointed out, that after global crisis uh, of 2008, regional disparities were increasing. One year, sometimes two years, disparities are decreasing. And in cohesion report, in all the papers, you are finding beautiful statements that cohesion is back on track. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's questionable. If, if it will be three, four, five years, then I will trust. And final uh, comment that uh, territorial cohesion, uh, we have problem with territorial cohesion what an elephant it is. Some people, there is perception by some that it is that, by other people that it is something different. But more and more territorial cohesion is concerning. Environment, sustainable development, circular economy, uh, climate uh, uh, change, uh, space of laws. Hmm. That's, 
Uh, and if you like to hear the music, uh, they can turn it off for half a, a, a minute. Yes, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Four minutes, 30 seconds, and he managed to tell us the eight key issues that are observable uh, in the key documents. Jacek, do you want to take 20 seconds to say why these gaps are there in the representation of territorial issues? Any comment about why you think they're missing? Uh, I think that ESPON is playing an important role, but uh, the most of uh, proposals, decisions are made uh, taking into consideration another uh, 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 patterns. Uh, 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 there are three dimensions of, of cohesion. Economic, there is DG responsible for that. Yeah. Uh, social, mm. there is DG responsible for that. Who is responsible for territorial cohesion? No one. Or ESPON, but ESPON is not mainstream. <laughs> OK, this is a very clear point. Jacek, thank you very much. You've really set up the conversation very well, and I think lots of people will want to come back to you. I'm frankly amazed you have time to read all of these documents. That's really uh, the first point. But uh, we move on. Um, Alison, will you now give us your reflections for five minutes, please, on these key issues? Sure. Um, is this on? Yeah. It is. OK. Um, thank you very much for the, for the invitation and um, to follow, if I can, um, Yasek's um, amazing summary. Um, I, I wanted to start with um, a reflection, actually, on something that Ilona said yesterday morning. She said, um, territorial cohesion is not rocket science. And indeed, it's not to anyone in this room. So we are preaching to the converted here. But there is a much bigger challenge ahead. And, and that challenge is, is something that, um, that Yasek has, has alluded to. But um, the question I think that we have to address is how can territorial cohesion, how can the territorial agenda be repositioned in the post-2020 framework to champion cohesion policy's future? Not just to be part of it, to actually champion it. Mm. Um, the state of play with the current debate regarding the post 2020 cohesion policy has a number of multifaceted challenges. At the macro level, we know for sure that we have challenges around the whole multi-annual um, budget. There are also issues around security, defence, migration. These are coming way up the agenda. We've been talking about them. And we know that they will, place, they will probably be placed centre stage in what's happening in the next programming period, and, and, and rightly so. But even within this, we have cohesion policy priorities which are fighting for space. Will the future cohesion policy be for all regions? Will it continue to have all the funds which underpin it now, the five funds? Will we continue on the same trajectory with the simplification agenda? A great deal of investment and effort has rightly so gone into this. And much of our attention is turning to what will this look like, a simplified cohesion policy of the future. And of course, we have this perpetual issue of the impact of cohesion policy. What is it really delivering on the ground? And furthermore, the cohesion policy community has a number of different voices. And these voices are not speaking in harmony, sadly. Mm. So this is a very, very confusing landscape. And within this, the territorial agenda is competing for visibility despite the fact that we all completely buy into the increased focus on a place-based agenda. And we all recognise the huge demand which is now in place for greater cooperation across EU territories. It's already been talked about by Andrew and, and Kai um, this morning. This need to generate critical mass, scaling opportunities, creating leverage, not least investment leverage. We can all buy into that. We all see it. But do we see that the territorial agenda actually boosts this agenda? We have to place more pressure on this. There is a risk that the territorial agenda is going to be sidelined or relegated in the next programming period. So what do we need to do? We need a new narrative. And as um, uh, Andrew has a, a already alluded to, the territorial reference framework process is going to allow us to test out and define some of this new narrative. And, and some suggestions there, which we've already talked about, actually, yesterday and a bit this morning. We need a new connectivity ethos to underpin the future territorial agenda. It needs to be focused on policies, and it needs to be focused on people. 
So connecting policies, what do we need to do there? If the place-based imperative is to address opportunities and challenges across EU territories, then we need policy concentration and we need investment alignment. The current programming period had a common strategic framework. Does anyone remember that? Has anyone been using it? It was supposed to bring together the five funds. We didn't do it. We weren't motivated to do it. We didn't see the purpose of doing it. If we had a place-based rationale under this, could we resurrect that framework? Could we reframe it? Could we reposition it under the territorial agenda? Something to think about. People connectivity. The EU project requires a solidarity renewal. We've been talking about it for the last day. Place has to have relevance and immediacy. And for this, we need to empower EU citizens in a way that we have ignored, certainly in the in previous and in the current programming periods, which comes back to quality of life indicators. The place agenda is at the heart of territorial cohesion. It's at the heart of what we've been talking about. So this is an opportunity to position people back in the core of that agenda. It's quite a qualitative area, but it's pretty powerful. And I think it's something where we can have more mileage. The final point I make is around territorial cohesion's EU added value. Again, we've talked about this, but have we really positioned it clearly? The territorial agenda addresses market failures. And it addresses these through addressing information deficiencies and through externalities, positive and negative externalities. The territorial analysis allows us to shine a spotlight on these matters and to demonstrate how the territorial agenda can help us to address information de deficiencies, which can bring regions and territories closer together in a way they currently don't work together, probably because they don't know enough about each other. We need to do much more in that space. The territorial analysis agenda can help us to do that. And of course, with externalities, we know of the many negative um, spillover effects which are happening. T without territorial analysis, we can't understand how these operate. We don't understand the dynamics behind it. So there's an opportunity to use the territorial agenda to better underpin EU added value. So I'll, I'll leave it on that point um, for now, but happy to take any questions, obviously. Great. Thank you very much, Alison. And there will be plenty of time for questions in a few minutes. Just before we come to uh, Romana and to Roland, let's uh, get your brains working a little bit on some votes. So Andreu said that a friend of his said that <laughs> only robots <laughs> will be happy in smart cities. Who thinks you will have to be a robot? to be happy in the smart city. If you think you will, raise your hands. OK, I can see three, four, five, somebody's uh, six, seven. OK, seven. Who thinks you will not have to be a robot to be happy in the smart city? OK, who is not voting for some reason or other? OK, OK, so that was five to um, 70 to 25 who didn't vote. OK, uh, now, um, Yasek said, that um, responsibility for territorial cohesion is unclear. Who agrees that responsibility for territorial cohesion is unclear? Please raise your hands. OK, who thinks it's not <laughs> unclear? OK, lots of you. And who's not voting? Let's see you as well. OK, lots of people not voting. So that was about 30, 20, 50 in terms of that vote. And then Alison <laughs> said, uh, we need a new narrative to support cohesion policy based on place, people, and added value. Who agrees with that statement? Who thinks we need a new narrative? OK, who thinks we don't need a new narrative? That's interesting. And about half of you not voting. So that was 50 yes, nobody for no, and 50 not voted. Thanks very much. OK, that's good. We know what you think. Uh, Romana, <laughs> please, will you take uh, five minutes to give your reflections? Thank you very much, Craig. Thank you very much for the invitation to take part in this panel. Um, I think that it is uh, really important to ensure that um, different policies and EU cohesion policy in particular take on board the territorial di dimension. This is also what, what Alison said. I would like to, to stress it once again. Um, and I also think that to do so, um, mainstreaming territorial cooperation in the ESIF should be seriously considered. Um, we all know that we are not talking about the big money 
of cohesion policy when we are talking about the transnational programs. And this is also why I think that the transnational programs should again have a stronger focus on their real strengths, which is the cooperation and joint development of strategies rather than on the physical investments, which uh, they will by nature never be able to support in a substantial way. Um, of course, the cohesion policy and others are very uh, well suited to support uh, cooperation in functional geographies. Uh, that's not only true on the interreg scale, but also for supporting smaller functional areas within member states or cross-border. And uh, here the geography and geographical scales matter. Uh, I think it's really important to uh, choose wisely the, the scale on which you are cooperating in. Um, in Germany, for example, we are trying um, to work on different functional geographical levels. At the macro-regional levels, um, for example, right now we're doing a really nice ESPON targeted analysis project um, where we prepare the vision for the uh, Alpine region for 2050 or at the Actaria project, which was presented yesterday here. And we are also going on the small scales uh, where we, for example, developed a future vision for the cross-border German-Polish area, which we actually don't call cross-border because we don't like the word border here. So we, we are using uh, the word linkage area. You see <laughs> I'm going, which direction I'm going here. And uh, in this case, we are currently working on the implementation of our vision. So um, the planning and territorial cooperation happens at different functional geographical scales. And the right level of cooperation needs to be considered for each and one development need to make the cooperation most effective. And politicians and other stakeholders also need to acknowledge that their responsibility goes beyond borders and that the cooperation with territories with similar interests is crucial there. Um, coming back to Germany, uh, we are a big country with really long borders right in the geographical center of Europe. So this means that our economic and other functional links are reaching far into the European territory. And um, the transnational interact programs are the only funding instrument of the EU which allows us to capitalize on these many connections in the European space and which gives uh, all our regions, not only the border regions, the opportunity to develop their potentials in cooperation with other regions who are very similar in the outlook. Um, Kai said it really nicely, cooperation is not a luxury, it's a need. So, um, the cooperation at different levels should be not restricted to interreg programs and funding only even if it's an effective funding instrument. All of the ESIF programs have the possibility to, go, to invest outside the program area. Um, I would like to go back once again to the territorial review. Yeah. Um, I would like to encourage you to read it or like go through the document uh, because I think oh, uh, that it uh, sums up uh, the right policy pointers for good cooperation. It says, for example, that you need to identify and involve the right, right stakeholders. You should also start from local development needs. Um, I will allow, my, allow myself to say, depending, of course, on the activity you are starting. Um, and that also the stakeholders should um, acknowledge that territorial cooperation can serve multiple purposes at different stages of the political cycle. Yeah. And territorial cooperation also needs to be based on functional areas. Um, one point I would like to make, um, somebody said it, that uh, we should also like look for the cooperation everywhere. Uh, one great example is uh, the VASAP, the cooperation of uh, ministers responsible for uh, spatial planning in the Baltic Sea region, where we don't, don't only cooperate on the uh, level of EU member states, we also have Belarus and Russia. So I would like to support Andrew here why not go and involve also the Mediterraneans? Mm. 
Thank you. Great. Romana, thank you very much indeed. Lots of interesting thoughts there, especially on this agenda for cooperation <coughs> and picking up the point that Alison made about externalities and spillovers and how cooperation mechanisms can really address those issues. We might come back to that. Um, Roland, welcome to you. Great to have you here with us. Your reflections, please. Great. Thanks, Greg. Um, I've been invited as um, a representative of a member state, uh, like many of my colleagues here in the room representing Austria, not only in the monitoring committee, but in also other uh, policy processes which have already been mentioned. Um, so as a civil servant working in this area, we are supposed to support and encourage and initi initi take initiatives for better policy making. So we are, not, so we are listening to the debate uh, with interest to the results of the research, the evidence, but we also look with the lens uh, on it, how to make it happen, how to contribute to make it happen with uh, the instruments available to us. I think this is the specific focus we have, and uh, we working on the policy side, we know that context matters, institutional context matters, and political context matters. Um, so from this perspective, I would like to add a few uh, uh, reflections. The first is a very basic one that also in respect to policy making, it is good to have ESPON. Uh, it's good to invest public funds time into this program in order to ensure that these kinds of debates, these kinds of uh, research could, could happen. Also the community building and the capacity, institutional capacity building in this respect, I think this is a good public investment. Besides that, I would like to um, refer to, um, yeah, to the, still the buzzword, maybe, territorial agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and to the question what kind of animal it could become or mm. it should become. Mm. Um, Jacek has um, uh, outlined several um, big elephants, policy processes which mm. are running, which will um, uh, take decisions, where decisions will be taken um, <laughs> within the next years. Um, so there is a, a big, not a jungle, but there's a wide landscape of policy processes mm -hmm. which could be addressed with, with territorial evidence. The territorial agenda is one of it. Mm -hmm. And I just want to remind that the territorial agenda is the, the prime product um, um, out of an intergovernmental process of cooperation between mm -hmm. member states. Uh, of um, ministers and, and, <laughs> administ and, and institutions responsible for territorial cohesion, mm. uh, whatever this means, this is, uh, uh, means different things in different countries. Mm. So the territorial agenda is linked with an intergovernmental process. Mm. Um, nevertheless, it should not work in, the, in a silo, so also our intergovernmental process, but it's, it is it's working on interlinkages with, with mm. EU policies, but also mm. in the multi-level system. Uh, when we talk about territorial policies, it's not only about EU policies, it's first of all about national and, and also in Austrian case, mm -hmm. you know that it's first of all the regions uh, mm -hmm. doing, um, uh, taking decisions. So in this respect, uh, the territorial agenda and also the work in this intergovernmental format has a specific role to play mm -hmm. and this role has to be developed. To, uh, just to confirm the information that under the current trio presidency of Estonia, Bulgaria and Austria, um, the a next oh, a step was taken uh, towards the revision of a territorial agenda. Um, not, I emphasize it's a, a step, another step. It's not imposing anything on future presidencies uh, and not defining what animal it will be, but it's uh, taking uh, serious the pol political decision of ministers taken under the Luxembourg presidency in 2015 uh, to work towards this agenda. So this step was taken and a, a roadmap was, was prepared. And in this roadmap, um, um, the inputs of ESPOND are not only welcome, but they are regarded as a very important uh, mm. basis for a dis discussion on the key policy areas, but also towards um, pathways of implementing or doing, uh, improving the policy framework um, uh, in 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 in, in uh, working, uh, yeah, in enhancing cooperation in this field. So this is uh, somehow inside the roadmap yeah. uh, for the next 
two years, kicking off the process, for, uh, uh, hoping of uh, um, constructive support, unconventional ideas, new new ideas for which inspire policymakers. Then working towards the total agenda. <laughs> um, yeah, coming back to the question, what what kind of animal it should become? Um, the elephant is a little bit the high road. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't now mention a small animal, but, but we have to work on that. Uh, what it should become is a, is a modern animal. Um, the title agendas so far, they have been quite traditional documents and processes. I think there is a general agreement that this, if uh, there will be a title agenda and a policy um, mechanism around, then, then this has to be adapted to yeah, modernized, innovate, becoming younger, um, more future, future oriented. So yeah. this, this, this already is a challenge beside the, 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 the content issues, the key uh, policy questions which could be um, addressed by a territorial agenda process. Great. Roland, thank you very much indeed. We, we won't have a vote about whether the territorial agenda should be an elephant, a horse or a <laughs> snake, because this could be a very complex vote. But you've made a very important point about the roadmap, the role of the trio of governments and how they've set about setting out this roadmap. And I think we're all indebted to you and your colleagues in the other two governments for doing that and being so precise. And you've made the point that the, the ESPON contribution to the development of this roadmap is going to be very important. Um, let's do three more votes before we come to the question. So one of the things that was stressed by Andreu and then supported very much by Romana was that territorial cohesion policy should look to address areas outside the EU borders, if you like, the neighbouring areas. Um, who thinks this is a priority? If you think it's a priority, raise your hands. Okay? If you think it's not a priority, raise your hands. Okay? Uh, lots of people not voting, though. Can we do that again? If you think it's not a priority, raise your hands. OK, if you think it is a priority, raise your hands. And if you're not voting, let's see you. Sorry, what is the priority? So th uh, <laughs> the, the proposition was that the territorial development policy in the future should address more completely the areas outside the EU borders, the neighboring countries, the Mediterranean, some parts of uh, uh, Russia, obviously, Norway, uh, and others. Ukraine. Ukraine, yeah, Southeast Europe more generally. So who thinks it is a priority? Let's do it one more time. Thank you very much. Who thinks it's not a priority? OK, that's interesting. Who's not voting? OK, that's about 40 in favor, 30 against, 30 not voting, more <laughs> or less. Um, uh, Romana made the point that uh, cooperation should be uh, a key focus of this, building upon the point made by Alison about spillovers and externalities. Who thinks that territorial cooperation should be a big feature uh, of the new policy framework? If you think it should, please raise your hands. No surprises with lots of geographers in the room. Thank you. <laughs> Who thinks it should not be a priority? No one? OK, we'll, we won't worry so, more, so much about that. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, one more question. Uh, Roland's contribution focused a lot on the intergovernmental nature of decision making in the EU framework and reminded us in a certain sense, very politely, that um, this has to be the subject of intergovernmental agreement and therefore the national dimension is very important. Who would like to see the, the ESPON work focused very much on building that intergovernmental agreement around the territorial framework. If you would, please raise your hands. The, the okay. Clear. Interesting. If you wouldn't, please Classic raise your hands. Now. Is the question clear? Not many people are voting. No. Okay. <laughs> so I can see that when no hands go up, it's very clear that, uh, uh, that I haven't got it quite right. So I apologize for that. Um, I'll come back to that question in a minute. Let's go to the debate. I'll formulate it more clearly. Um, can we see the questions that have so far come through on Slido, please? And uh, see how we're getting on there. And what we'd like to do, panelists, is invite you to be quite quick with your answers so that multiple people can comment on each question and so that we can deal with a lot of them. Uh, question prioritized by eight people. Is there a need for a new long-term European territorial development perspective or vision? 
Jacek, why don't you comment on that first, and then, Andrea, will you say something about it, just building upon what <coughs> you said? Keep it short, gentlemen, and we'll have some more contributions as well. Uh, in my opinion, the last territorial agenda from Gödöllö, Hungary, uh, of 2011 was quite good product. But since then, uh, we are facing different mega trends in Europe, yeah. which changed the, the landscape dramatically. So we have to adjust our thinking, and that's uh, logical that we have uh, to do that. The second reason could be that this uh, territorial agenda was successful as a, a, as a product of good quality, mm. but uh, uh, not successful as a policy outline. Mm. So we have to learn on uh, weaknesses mm. also, mm. trying to think what to do to be successful. Thank mm. you. And which differences, uh, which weaknesses would you try to address? Mm. Of course, uh, starting from territory matters. It, it was more or less by Andreu presented. Mm. Then searching for European value added, mm. what is uh, in key in the agenda. Then uh, European public goods, if mm. we could create something like that mm. within our, uh, uh, within our uh, approach, within our policy. <coughs> and certain priority <coughs> areas after three keynote speakers uh, and panel discussion seems clear uh, mm. to be taken uh, into the future. Of course, as an example, cross-border cooperation, yes, but cooperation, cross-border cooperation uh, on external borders, mm. where uh, it was moved outside regional policy. Mm. So uh, simplifying relations were so uh, Kiev, not uh, Lublin, uh, Lviv. Yes, okay. Thank you. Very good. Um, can we have another microphone over here, by the way, if we could have one? I'd like to pass that microphone to Andreu, but it would be nice if we had two microphones. Is not yes. more... <coughs> oh, you okay? Carry on. Well, yes. <laughs> well I agree with, with Jacek. Yeah. Just, just one, one silly comment. Yeah. You allow me? Yes, please. <laughs> so when, when we say territory matters, yeah. I think we should say territory don't matters. Yes. Because, oh, no, don't matters. Because yeah. it obviously matters. Matters so much that we, we can even talk about. Yeah. You know, if you, are, yeah. if you like psychoanalysts, you understand yeah. that the most important thing are precisely those you cannot talk much. Yeah. So, you know, territory matters that much in Europe that you don't want to see the losers, the territory losing and the territory winner, winning. So territories, we are oversensitive to ter territories in Europe, not much in the US. Mm. So I think we should convince people that territory don't matter that much. So let's, let's, let's be explicit on territorial issues in Europe. You know, when you see the territories, I mean, political jurisdictions on territories, you see the borders of the yeah. countries and so yeah. on, you are in trouble. So maybe it's, it's, it's good if, yeah. if, I mean, territorial cooperation is forbidden by the Spanish constitution to yeah. begin with, forbidden yeah. within yeah. Spain. Yes. And I don't know what happens in Hungary and other countries. I don't know if territor I mean, territorial co cooperation is yeah. allowed in the different, so territory matters too much. Yeah. So it's good if we can relax this thing and say, okay, in yeah. the next millennium, in the millennium we are, maybe territory is not such an oversensitive thing. Yeah. And we can make maps showing that many things happen in different places and we are not so sensitive. So maybe the n new narrative we have to think about is <laughs> emphasizing that please don't give such a importance to territory. So we can talk yeah. about we'll territory. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, everyone in the room will interpret what you've just said in different ways. <laughs> and, uh, and therefore, it's probably quite important to clarify as we go along. But what I understood you to say is that jurisdictions don't matter, but places do. And yes, but ter territory is a political concept. Yes. Place, place yes. Is, is, mm, yes. is not just can be political or not, but territory yes. is, but it's also is, a military is a political concept, construct. So. Yeah. Okay, Jacek, a quick remark, and then we're going to uh, move on. My feeling was that we are trying to avoid uh, the concept one solution fits all, yeah. because Europe, European regions, European territories are very diversified. So yeah. you have to take different approaches. And 
my feeling, what, why I was supporting that, was that you have to uh, have fine tuning of, of, of uh, policies. Absolutely. Great. Romana, can you pick up the second question, please? How do we increase the added value and impact of EU territorial agenda on policy-making processes at European national and regional scales? And then, uh, Roland, we'll ask you to comment on this as well, saying a bit about the national perspective. Mm. Yeah, I, I see here maybe like three, three points uh, which could be addressed. Um, first of all, um, it is important uh, to start now um, working on specific tasks and uh, maybe to speak about ex actions uh, which will um, help us to put the principles of the territorial agenda into political practice. And uh, here um, the uh, colleagues from uh, um, the Urban Matters could be a good example uh, and show us how to launch uh, some concrete individual projects. Um, another point, um, how to increase the added value and impact of the territorial agenda would be um, we need to make a policymaker notice that many policies have territorial dimension. Mm -hmm. I know you probably do this all of the time at your work. I am trying to do this in Germany too, in my own ministry, but still people don't understand this. And um, one example for this would be um, the trans-European networks, for example. Uh, within the networks, there is the possibility to develop the so-called urban nodes. When a larger city is located on a transnational corridor, the fact alone that it is now part of a greater infrastructure will inevitably have effects on the city development. And uh, one shouldn't see this uh, as a burden, but as an opportunity. And the EU uh, even provides money to finance this, uh, completely outside the cohesion policy, mm. and um, in order to support such, uh, such development processes. So that's something uh, we need to capital, uh, capitalize on much more and make it clear to those colleagues working with the sectoral policies. Mm. Um, writing a new territorial agenda is one thing, but leading a debate with the sectoral policies is another thing. And I think it was under the Belgian EU presidency, uh, there was an attempt to organize meetings with uh, uh, people responsible for spatial development and people responsible for sectoral policies. So maybe we should go back to this and try to organize such meetings annually at different levels, local, regional, national, European levels, to make really clear that there is the territorial dimension of sectoral policies. Yeah. Romana, thank you very much. Actually, you've answered the question I was trying to formulate, but not very oh, well a few minutes ago, sorry. which in a sense is, how do you advocate for territorial policies with national mm. governments that have sectoral organization? And you've answered the question very, very clearly, what, what you need to do there. And Roland, I want to invite you to add to this. So, of course, how do we uh, increase the valid value and the impact of EU territorial policies, but how do we advocate them to national governments so that they see the value? Mm. Um, yes, on the f first part of your question, uh, uh, I share Romana's view that uh, it's not about writing a document or revising a document. Um, it's also not about uh, formulating a vision, but it's the, 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 the issue is how to improve policy making cooperation of countries with other sectors, DGs and so on, on specific issues in a realistic way. So mm -hmm. one should not be too idealistic, mm -hmm. but on, on some issues um, there could, uh, uh, progress could, could be made and for that it requires a framework, uh, framework uh, on, on a policy, uh, on policy priorities, but also uh, a governance framework. Yeah. And uh, also uh, think that uh, the, the examples uh, of, the, of the urban agenda framework, but also to what's happen, happening in the macro-regional uh, uh, approach is as a policy, as a governance um, uh, model, something one could look at, learn from, and then adapt it to, to the need. And the second part on the national, for us working on the national level, it's of course, a, an ongoing challenge to internationalize mm. the national activities. It mm. starts from a national strategy, how, mm. independently from the status, to, to ensure that the international uh, functionalities, transnational, are considered and, 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 and perceived and not mm. a nation state mm. uh, as an island. 
but it also um, uh, requires capacity building and um, mm -hmm. a variety of tools and um, support to the uh, actors from, from, from the low, lower levels, regional and local levels. And as you mentioned, that it's not allowed, territorial cooperation is not allowed in, in Spain. Mm. In Austria, the, 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 the most of the partners working in Interreg or territorial cooperation are coming from the cities, from the regions. So they have their international relations. The, the role of the national level is a specific one. Um, Yes, and, there and, are and, and so constitutional and so rules. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let, let me just a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's forbidden, it's that it's informal. Mm -hmm. So two regions can, within Spain, two regions cannot create a formal institution to cooperate. Yeah. And forget about, let's say, municipalities in the Basque, mm -hmm. France and Spain together, forget mm -hmm. about. But yeah. even within Spain, they cannot create formal institutions, but informally, of course, they can. Mm -hmm. Yes, people will find this a bit strange, but there are many constitutional arrangements <coughs> where legally, governments are not allowed to spend any resources, any money, any time on anything that's outside their border. Yes. And that's really what Andrea is referring to. It's extraordinary, <coughs> but important. Let's pick a, so in a minute, we're going to pick up this question about crisis, crisis, crisis that Vincent has uh, raised, where he's essentially asking, aren't there any positive stories? Coming back to the, the idea that Alison put forward about the need for a new narrative. But before we do that, Alison, could you lead some response to this question about the role of territorial cooperation and how it could be further and better promoted? Um, <clears throat> Yes, um, how can it be better, further and better promoted? Well, it comes back to the, the added value dimension, but the other side of the added value dimension is the cost of non-Europe. Hmm. And we haven't talked a lot about that um, yesterday or today, but I think we need to be bolder in what are the costs of non-Europe. So what happens if we don't have cross-border cooperation? What happens in the absence of macro-regional strategies, the Connecting Europe facility, and actually the single market? Mm. What happens if we don't have these things? And, and there are some, because we, we have them and we, we generally like them. Mm. Um, there are, I think there are a few, I mean, they are, they are a threat to the member state. Yes, they are. Um, and that's a, a rather political narrative. But the threat of taking them away is something that I think is quite a compelling case. And I think we need to provide more um, counterfactual evidence in, in, that, in that dimension to be able to, to come back and, and actually fight for the importance of the, the territorial um, agenda for the, for the future. OK, thank you very much indeed. So in a minute, we're going to come to this interesting question from Vincent about you know, how do we provide directions for territorial cohesion that are positive stories, probably not uh, simply involving GDP. But before I get the panellists to comment on that, anybody waiting to just ask a question on any topic? Anybody want to raise their hand? No? All happy with the Slido? Not everybody likes Slido. Some people prefer the old style. No? OK. Good. Well, let's answer this question then. So we're looking forward. We're trying to create a positive story uh, around territorial cohesion. Where would you begin if you had to create such a positive story. And Jacek, I'm going to ask you to start. <coughs> Maybe a side uh, uh, statement, but uh, in my opinion, promotion of achievements of that policy is rather weak. And uh, uh, often uh, uh, we, uh, citizens even do not know that it was arranged for co-finance made mm. using uh, European policies. Mm. And I saw the first paper uh, about promotion of that, I saw uh, during Malta as the presidency, which mm. was approved, a very, very good one, what we, we uh, should uh, uh, show a success story. Mm. But uh, I think that there is typical set of things which should uh, happen. It is uh, best practices exchange. Yeah. It costs relatively little, but uh, it gives uh, strong 
a mul multiplier uh, uh, effect, uh, uh, financing different pilot projects. Uh, mm. That's uh, usually uh, uh, cost also very little, but it mm. gives uh, additional mm, value. Yeah. And I think that <coughs> what I'm afraid very much of is the recentralization, I call it double recentralization of cohesion policy and approaches. Mm. First one, uh, that uh, we apply concept of shared management, that mm. it is split between Brussels and um, countries. Uh, it seems that uh, more and more it is returning to Brussels. So mm. we are losing that mm. uh, effect which are on uh, different uh, places. Mm. And then uh, if you compare the size, uh, uh, the amount of uh, resources which are managed in EU member countries in 2014, tw 2020, on central level compared mm. with previous programming period, it is, uh, it, is, uh, it is more on central level than uh, before. It means that in many countries, it is recentralization within. Mm. So of course, they, maybe they have a better effect, uh, mm. general economic, but uh, it's not an effect which is uh, connected with particular places and uh, it means often loss of capacity on regional level. Yes, it's also got a rather ironic nature to it, hasn't it? The centralised territorial cohesion policy doesn't quite make sense, does it? But uh, there we go. Um, so, Jacek's made five key points. Firstly, we should focus more on the achievements of cohesion policy and also the accreditation towards the EU level of those achievements. Secondly, focus more on best practices and the highlighting of them. Thirdly, more experiments in terms of pilot projects, investing in them. Next, getting the balance of the co-management processes right so that there is uh, more, as it were, uh, management happening uh, on the decentralized level. In fact, that's, that's five key points. So, Alison, can you build on that? If you were developing this positive narrative around territorial cohesion as we look to the future, would you agree with those? Would you add more? Yeah, I would, I would certainly agree um, with those. We, the evidence base is weak. Um, it has to be stronger, it has to be bolder, and I think it has to be more compelling. I think the other aspect for me is about how do you motivate? What are the incentives for... Is this not working? Is it, try the other one. Apologies for that. It's okay. Better? Oh, yeah. Um, how do we incentivise better... Co the cooperation mm. across um, different geographies and, mm. and particularly um, inter-regionally. Mm. Um, yes, we have an inter-reg Europe programme. It's very popular. It's well-liked. But it's, um, it's, does it really get the message out about what it's achieving? Mm. Um, and there's, a, there's another element of this, and it's, it's relatively new, um, but it's, um, it, it goes to, it's a bottom-up process that, that I would point to, which is around cooperation for the innovation agenda, for regional innovation, um, which has taken on a new, a new range of, um, of measures at the EU level in thematic smart specialisation platforms. This is the bringing together of specialisations across regions, um, naturally and voluntarily, to work together. Um, in areas where they want to. No one's forcing them to do it. Mm. And this is a fantastic news story because it has been self-mobilising, mm. it has been entirely voluntary, and it is delivering new types of cooperation mm. and a new evidence base mm. around where Europe's specialisations lie in terms of international competitiveness mm. that we've uh, hitherto been unable to, to really recognise because much of this in the past has been top down. So I think when there is an incentive from a bottom-up perspective to bring territories together, mm. to encourage how they scale up their, um, their assets and their, their levels of cooperation, Europe has an enormous story to tell. Um, but we, we need to provide, we need to facilitate that process better than we currently do. Thank you very much. It reminds me of one of the points that was made yesterday, was the importance of focusing on Europe's leadership at the global level. And some of these 
policies actually being part of a global leadership agenda for Europe around sustainable long-term territorial development, tackling of regional disparities, all the things that uh, Andrea was raising, that actually it's, a, it's an agenda that resonates uh, globally uh, in a certain way that's very important. Now we've got three or four other questions to tackle, but I just want to see if Romana or Roland or Andrea want to add to this, how do we build a positive narrative? After that, Andrea, I'm going to ask you to talk about how do we engage the stakeholders in all of this. But before that, <laughs> let's, let's just talk about any more to add on the point. I would like to answer this question, not the second one. It's much more difficult. <laughs> yes, well, we got, but we, we're giving you the difficult questions today. Oh, no. <laughs> Anything um, to add on the positive agenda? Yeah, Romana? Me? Just to... I, I, I think uh, Jacek uh, summed it up perfectly clear. Uh, I think we really need good storytelling because most of the times people really notice that something was uh, financed from, from uh, cohesion funds and policy. Only if there is like a new street or new bridge with this uh, blue sign, it yeah. was financed from EU funds and still most of the people won't understand. So we really need uh, better storytelling at all levels. Okay, very good. Roland, anything to add? Um, to add um, from the policy maker side, what ca can we really do is uh, communication, of course, is important, storytelling, what, uh, make aware of what already happens, but also to feed in new ideas, new, new um, um, yeah, f f uh, possibilities, and in this respect, any forward-looking approach of, of uh, what, what are potentials, what are good practices from other areas, and to provide context of exchange and dialogue, because it's not only spreading knowledge, but also provide the, the context um, uh, of uh, the right stakeholders, then to develop this further in a very incremental way. What are your needs and what are new ideas? And yes. go ahead, the next step. Okay. Andrea, anything to add on this question about the positive Thank you. narrative? Thank you. Two short ideas. Yeah. Uh, the first, uh, I had a feeling that, well, I mean, I, feel, I agree with everybody saying that cohesion depends maybe more on other things than on the funding. Let's say a monetary policy. Monetary policy is critical, but mm -hmm. also the single market. So mm -hmm. maybe in the future, further more liberalization on some sectors may, may, may be beneficial for mm -hmm. cohesion. Mm -hmm. It's not just that more liberalization is always worse. Maybe in the future this will change. For instance, in maritime policy and air policy, attracting investment from China and some places of Europe, whatever. And the second thing, uh, I was shocked in one uh, SPON seminar in Greece uh, that the person, uh, you know, giving the introductory, uh, the welcome to the facility where we were, mm. just said, uh, don't think that this facility was paid with uh, European uh, funds. Mm. We pay this by ourselves, mm. okay? Meaning, this narrative we have until now saying, okay, cohesion policy is helping uh, citizens to realize how important Europe is in their lives. Uh, I think this is over in many parts of Europe. So the mm. positive narrative of cohesion is not waiting or expecting that people are thank, say thanks to Europe because mm. of the funds. Thank you very much. There's, a, there's an interesting political economy dimension to that. But also, you made some very important points about macro policies to do with currency, labor mobility, all sorts of other things that we ought to bear in mind. You, sir, wanted to ask a quick question. Yes. Uh, Please be quick. Carry on. It'll, it'll, it's on. OK. Not a question, a comment on uh, this about positive stories of uh, cross-border cooperation. Uh, as you may know, Denmark is uh, the land that has the highest share of wind energy production for its electricity. It's 42%. On the 18th of September this year, Every windmill in Denmark stood completely still. Uh, but no lights turned out in Denmark at that time. And why didn't it? Because they got electricity from Sweden and Norway, because we have a common grid. So there were no effects at all. Mm. So that was an example of Nordic cooperation in this field. Very good. Well, I think we should give them a round of applause. Well done, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if there were prizes for wind en energy cooperation, uh, they would win them there.
some, we have to, we've got about seven minutes and we want to come back to this question that a moment is at the bottom and Andrea, we are going to ask you to answer it. But before that, let's tackle a couple of others. Quick question, quick answer. Um, Jacek, look at Adriana's question. If place-based integrated policies are what is most needed, should ETC set aside the traditional sectoral structure? Yes or no, Jacek? And maybe no. Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> Let's look at the next one. Uh, policies at the national level are normally different from those seen in cities and regions. Can this policy discrepancy be resolved in a creative way? And Romana, can you tackle that? Do you think it can yeah, be? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's be creative. I think, in, uh, for example, in Germany, we have uh, no uh, competencies in spatial planning on a national level. So that's uh, all, everything the regions do. But if they don't do, we still have some instruments we can like, encourage some regions to participate, uh, for example, in some uh, competitions to develop uh, more like, modern, uh, future-oriented um, projects uh, to develop something we would like to encourage them to do. Okay. So, yeah, let's be creative. Very good. Okay, Alison, considering the key challenges for the development of cities and regions, what should be the main areas of intervention at the European scale? It's a big one. And the next one's coming um, to you, Roland. Um, <laughs> the main areas of intervention. Um, well, I, I think it comes back to, for me, it's about the the agglomeration agenda, which we've talked a great deal about, the positives and the negatives. And um, we're still singing the positives of that story far too much from an EU narrative perspective. We mm. need to understand better what is happening, what is the dynamic. And this, this, this notion that has been raised relatively recently, and people don't like to talk about it, distance decay. Mm. That um, it's less than 200 kilometers from a core that the real benefits of innovation, mm. knowledge are diffused. We mm. need to understand that better and we need to stop pretending mm. that the agglomeration rationale is still applies as much as it, as it always did. It's okay. fighting against other policies. And that, that leads on to path dependency as well. Mm. And we recognise then that there are other policies which will support that agglomeration um, dynamic in the dynamic areas mm. and will fail to support those um, those other regions, um, and I take Horizon 2020, the framework programme, as a classic example of that. Great, thank you very much. Roland, is the territorial agenda competing with the urban agenda? No, of course not. It, it is not competing and should not compete, but it should complement each other. So it's no different uh, worlds. Uh, they're working in the same direction and uh, they are addressing it from different angles. But at the very end, it should be seen as a policy working in the same direction. Great. Thank you very much. Andreu, so the last question. Who should be the leaders and key stakeholders in the territorial agenda process? And how should we mobilize those stakeholders to contribute to its success? <laughs> Uh, this is for, for you, the question. No, no, no. It's for, <laughs> Andrea, I think that's for you. But uh, we only have... Creative a, ideas are coming this from your depend, side. Depend, depends <laughs> on... But we'll, we'll get Roland to make a comment afterwards. But yes. Oh, the key players are member states, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it? And how do you want to mobilize some, I'm some, them? I'm some, other, I'm some others. Okay. It's a key member state and some others. And Roland, how are you going to mobilize these member states? Yes, that's <laughs> what I want to know. <laughs> um, it will not be me mobilizing <laughs> the leadership, but as I try, uh, try to explain in my first intervention, uh, it probably will be a step-by-step -step process, an incremental way of developing things, mm. and we'll see, we have done under this three or <coughs> first or a next step, and we will see how the process will, will, will um, progress. Um, there is a vision, but the vision is not exactly defined, so let, let's develop, uh, develop a vision. Uh, not only the vision, but also the way forward. And, and the, the important thing is that it, uh, we start to work. But okay. I, I just, just to add that in, in the project, we will try to create a number of events which are open to member states and other people, and, and not just to have votes or have any stakeholders' uh, discussions of interest, but trying to think uh, in, a, in, a, in an open way in the future of Europe and territorial agenda, just to provide useful and interesting and inspiring 
evidences yeah. for the like new territorial yeah. agenda. Yeah. Sounds like there's a deal here that Andrea will help with colleagues to build the vision if you will advocate with the other member states. That's the, the deal, Roland. Yes. The deal is already done. Good. <laughs> <laughs> because during the Austrian presidency, which, we, which I, we, I will explain later, we will try to mutually uh, Great. Uh, cooperate. We're going to have a final comment subject. from Jacek, then we're going to do two <laughs> quick votes. Good. Jacek, it has to be quick. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm always leaving my uh, computer turned off for the night, and if I have problems, sometimes I'm getting in the morning angel paper, which is, uh, you know, dealing with key issues. And I think that what is the important European value of cohesion policy is the scope covering all European regions. Mm -hmm. And in one of three scenarios, which are uh, in pile uh, by European Commission, and the assistance to Spanish, uh, Italian, uh, East German regions is evaporating, is disappearing. 75-90% mm. mm. of EU average. I think it would be big loss because then it would create cohesion policy as a ghetto for poorest region only in Central and Eastern Europe. Right. So, Thank you. Very profound. Let's now go to a vote. We have two votes that we want you to take. Please open Slido, be ready to vote. Can we have the, uh, the first kind of summary vote, please? So we're trying to summarize this conversation. What trends may be more influential for your European territorial future in your view? Is it migration flows to and from Europe and the rest of the world, social inequity, particularly in large cities, regional economic disparities, climate change, technological developments, which do you think will be most important? Please vote now. I don't think Elvis Presley is quite what we need right at the moment. But. <laughs> I always need Elvis Presley. <coughs> OK, let's, um, let's give you just one minute more. I don't know if we'll get to 100, but I'm not going to worry about that. If we get past 75, we'll have a look. So if you're hovering with your finger, there we go. Can we have a look at the results, please? OK, so migration flows to and from Europe and the rest of the world. This was a point, of course, raised by Andreu just in the last interaction. But the regional economic disparities that have been picked up by a lot of people, Alison's remarks about the, the weaknesses in the agglomeration <coughs> model, the failure to recognize externalities properly, technological developments, which we've been discussing, of course, all the way through the last day and a half, very interesting. Climate change really emerging as a dimension of this agenda. and then. Inequality within cities, still a lot of people voting for that as well. Very important. Thank you very much. We're up to 90 now. Let's go to question two, if we may. Uh, what should be the key elements of the territorial approach in future policies? Is it planning and making investment in functional areas, cross-border areas, functional urban areas, etc.? Is it providing support, institutional capacity and investment for design and implementation of local and regional development strategies? Or is it introducing ter territorial cooperation elements and initiatives in all support programs and operations? Of course, these are not exclusive choices, but uh, please do vote now so that we can see which ones you prefer. Thank you very much for voting. It does help and also it allows us in the report of the conference to really reflect what the mood of the room was and that's useful for us. Okay, we've crossed the threshold of 80 votes so let's have a look at the results so far if we may. So providing support, inst uh, institutional capacity and investment for design and implementation of local and regional development strategies comes first. But as you can see, there's a, quite an even spread here. And people in the room think all three elements are important. There's no uh, dominant winner. And uh, as the votes go up, you can see um, the slides moving around. So that's very helpful. <laughs> Thank you for your votes. Well, it's been a fascinating two-hour conversation. And we've really covered the ground, I think 
on uh, the future uh, territorial agenda uh, for Europe. We look forward, of course, to the work that Andreo talked about right at the beginning, the, the fascinating studies that are going on. Claudia's brilliant presentation that put into context all of the work that's already there. And of course, Kai's remarks that focused us, focused us very much on illustrating different versions of territorial implications of some of the developments that are already going on. And then we've had our fantastic panel. And I'd like you, before you break for coffee and then come back here on time at 11.30, to join me in thanking this brilliant panel. Thank you very much indeed.